our good friend Rabbi Chaim Bruck from the synagogue in Bozeman. Rabbi, uh, great to have you on the show this morning, and it's been so cool to see how you've been serving uh, all of all of your friends, uh, even during these lockdowns and shutdowns and everything like that. How have you been? Well, we've been hanging in there, thank God. And uh, when you talk about the 10 plagues, I think we've found plague number 11. You know, if only God had COVID-19 back during the exodus of Egypt, he would have solved the Egyptian problem a lot quicker. But, um, you know, all jokes aside and all humor aside, um, it's obviously a very challenging time. I'm a, I'm a native from Brooklyn, New York, and, uh, you know, I, I probably know 25 people myself, elder, elderly members of the community I grew up in in Crown Heights in Brooklyn that have passed in the last two weeks. Wow. And so it's uh, li- literally a day-to-day thing. But at the same time, we are a people of faith. We are a people of determination. The Jewish people have been through a hell of a lot worse than COVID-19 in its history. And we're going to get through this as well. Is there fear and anxiety? Sure. I mean, people are losing their jobs, their businesses. People are dying. People are ill. My father had corona. My uncles have corona. Um, and we pray for them all day. But at the same time, people are yearning and searching now that they're home, and there's, not, there's no distractions, there's no, sport, there's no sports games, there's no movie theaters, there's, no, there's none of that. All we have is the opportunity to be at home and think about who we really are, what, what really matters to our soul. And when we do that, it brings about an opportunity to grow and to find the deep spirituality. And I think that um, when we come out on the other side of this, we're going to see uh, a, a growth in spiritual awareness. At least that's what I'm finding in the Jewish community. That's what, I, I wonder if that if if people are if this time is really getting people to really think about because I, I was I was thinking about this the other day. What what is this current generation of youth? What is their takeaway going to be from this? Because you know you know you know if the Great Depression era had such an impact on on that generation of young people who grew up during that era, our grandparents and great grandparents. Um, Now, obviously we haven't had to have that kind of a sacrifice yet. Hopefully we don't have to have that kind of a sacrifice. Uh, But, but I wonder what the takeaways are and are there people? So you see it here in Montana, you think people are seeking out uh, answers to questions of what is life really about and and what really matters in life and getting away from the silly stuff. Yeah, Aaron, I think that any time, any time that life is in the balance, when people don't know if they're going to make it through, if they're going to survive, if their relatives are going to survive, it forces us to ponder the question of the meaning of life. In other words, if life is so worth fighting for, what exactly am I fighting for? What is so exciting about this life? What is so important about this life that I want to make sure that those medications and those vaccines work so that I can live another day? Most people, if you get them at the core, they're not going to tell you, I want to live another day so I can finally watch the Vikings win the Super Bowl. That's not what, you know, first of all, that would be beyond faith. I mean, to think that the Vikings would ever win the Super Bowl, you'd have to be more <laughs> religious than I am. But, but, but my, point, my, point, my, my point is that people, when you ask them, and I do it a lot because I think it's important for people to ponder, why is life worth living? Why am I fighting to get a box of matzah? I don't mean little, but why, why am I asking the rabbi to drop off a box of matzah for Passover to celebrate an exodus from over 3,000 years ago? Um, and why is that important to me? Why is it important for my children in 2020 to know about an exodus from, from 3,000 years ago? And the answer is that we have a soul. And if you have a soul and there's a spiritual experience, a spiritual component to our existence, then there's meaning to life. And so I think it's inevitable, whether people will admit it today or not, we are going to see a resurgence in spirituality. I don't know that organized religion necessarily is suddenly going to see a a surge in membership, because I think our society has shifted away from the membership, you know, the pay-to-pray type of system. But an interest in God, an interest in in the Old Testament, in the Torah, in, in, in spirituality, in ethics and morality... You know, even the laws of modesty, right? For years, as an Orthodox rabbi, I don't shake hands with people of the opposite gender. My wife shakes the women's hands. I shake the men's hands. Right now, no one's judging me for that. You know, I, you know, <laughs> that's I, right. I don't yeah, because I've been with you. And, I've people. been with you that so, it, you know when it's like, oh, that's right. Yeah, I just shake your hand. Exactly. And, you know, and uh, and 
and that's and that's cool. It's it's all about respecting people's uh, viewpoints and, and and beliefs. You know, and it's inter- interesting too when you talk about what is life really about. And life goes by so quick. Whether it's the coronavirus, look, I, I I had to look it up just to be sure I was accurate on this. But yeah, General George S. Patton. You think about you think about everything he survived in combat, and yet and yet how did he die? He died from a freak car accident at 60 he survived all this other stuff and he dies from a freak car well, that, we don't know what's gonna that that, what's gonna take us right there's that meme that's going around that all the stupid things i've done in my life if i die for touching my face that's gonna be really stupid <laughs> you know and, and and so and so yes i mean it does make people ponder their existence and that's a good thing because what they're going to find right no one ponders their existence and concludes that there's no meaning i mean very few people ponder their existence and come to the conclusion that life is not worth living. What they do conclude is that there's so much meaning and there's so much depth. And there's obviously a reason when I wake up in the morning, it's God saying that I matter again. Because guess what? He didn't have to allow us to wake up in the morning. And the fact that we did means there's something that I can accomplish, something that I can do that's transformative for myself, for my family, for my community. And so even in this virus, even during this crazy time, even in a time when there's so much mourning and so much sadness, and there is a lot of despair and anxiety, and I myself don't know. Can I predict to you right now on the radio that I won't contract somehow COVID-19? I don't, and therefore there's a part of me that is anxious. But at the same time, if you're too busy being productive and doing things to better society during this time, then you don't have a lot of time to think about your mortality. You're focused on what you're going to do with the time that God has allotted to you, which is the right now. And so I, what I did you last night is I penned a letter. I wrote a, a three-page letter to my two-year-old daughter. She's, she's going to, you know, we're going to get through COVID-19, and she's not going to know anything. She's living a blissful life right now. She runs around. She doesn't know that she, she doesn't even realize she's not in school, you know. And, and so I want her to know how Passover was back in 2020 when we were experiencing this incredible thing where instead of celebrating as a community with friends and family, I normally have hundreds <clears throat> hundreds of people coming through my the synagogue doors during Passover. And this year, we're delivering matzah today. Uh, 30 families are going to pick up ready-made Passover meals to go that my wife, Javi, cooked for them at the synagogue. But we're going to be alone for the eight days of Passover, just our family. And that is new. That's uncharted territory. The last time this happened was three, you know, 3,300 years ago, the actual exodus when God passed over the Jewish homes, that, hence the name Passover. Um, was that, that was the last time Jewish families were alone on Passover. Mm. And there's something to be said about that, and I want my daughter, when she grows up, to hear it from me, not as a, you know, telling it to her 10 years from now, but what I felt back then. So I wrote her a three-page letter of all the positive things that Passover 2020 brought about. The gratitude, the meaning of family, the meaning of life, the, 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 the attitudes that, that Americans have shifted to, right? Who, who thought that as Americans, as Montanans, we'd simply be grateful for breathing? Something so basic. Rabbi, great to have you on the show again this morning. Yeah, I was I was going to pull up the email uh, back and forth we had here, but I said, hey, do you want to join us on the radio? And you said, well, it better be soon because we go into lockdown, even more so than the current lockdown that the rest of us well, are facing. Well, on, on, the, on, the on the Jewish Sabbath and Jewish holiday, we don't, in Jewish tradition, we don't use technology, we don't drive our cars, we don't watch TV, we don't look on the internet. Like you said, no iPhones, no, no iPads. And so it's really, you have to be very creative to spend time with your family and especially without the community joining. Normally we have a lot of action going on at the synagogue, but without that, you know, we got we, we quickly got a trampoline before the holidays so the kids will be busy with that. We're, <laughs> we're trying everything we can to make the experience one that's memorable. But I, I do think that, you know, for, for people listening and for even for me and you, Aaron, you know, the, the world is very chaotic right now. People are throwing out numbers, statistics. There's everyone, everyone's an expert in infectious diseases. You know, everyone <laughs> in the grocery the knows it. And, and, and which masks do work, which masks don't work, the gloves. Everyone's an expert. But the Spying on their neighbors, remember, you know, all sorts exactly, of experts. You know, there, that, yeah. that, that thank God we don't have in Montana, I don't think. <laughs> Not as yeah. badly, at least. Um, yeah. If I spied on my neighbor, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Let's just say I'd be in the ER, but it wouldn't be for uh, Corona. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, but the, the, It'd be the Glock reality, 19 instead of COVID-19. Exactly. Really. Another, another exactly. <laughs> so, so the, the, but the, the truth is that if you think about the exodus from Egypt, right, right after the exodus, when the Jewish people were freed from Egypt, they were after 80 years of harsh slavery where, the, where their children were being used, their babies were being used as cement in the walls of, uh, of Ramses. So it, it was an incredible time of, of harsh, harsh reality. 
And suddenly, out of the blue, a Moses shows up and says, hey, you know, God met me at a burning bush, and he told me that I'm going to take you, that I'm going to lead you out of this country. And they all thought he was out of his mind. And the reality is that, that when, when the moment was ripe, when it was supposed to happen, he led them right out of Egypt to Sinai, where God gave them the Old Testament, the Torah. And what were the first words of the Ten Commandments? I always think that it's fascinating. God says, I am Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. He doesn't say, I am Lord your God who created heaven and earth. I am Lord and God who created the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. No, I, who am I? You want to know God's description, self-description? I am God your Lord who took you out of Egypt. Because what God is telling us, that even when you're suffering, even when you're in a state of Egypt, you know, you're in bondage, you're enslaved, you're, you're truly experiencing hardship, I am your, the Lord your God, meaning I am a God that cares about you when things aren't going well. So it's important. It rescues you struggle. too. That's yeah. That's that's fascinating. In, well, he rescues, there, yeah. he rescues us when he wants to rescue us, and when it's time to be rescued. He doesn't rescue us on our timeline. Yeah. He rescues us on his timeline, which is very bothersome to many people, including myself, on occasion, because I really wish he would work with my schedule. But he is the God that cares about people suffering, and so knowing that, knowing that in the suffering there's a there's a God in heaven who actually gives it down. There's a God in heaven that cares about me and wants to see me through this is a very comforting concept, and God made that clear in the first of the Ten Commandments, because creating heaven and earth is a big deal. But even a bigger deal is that someone that created heaven and earth still cares about the regular small person who's struggling and suffering through an individual or collective struggle. And in this case, obviously, it's collective. But there's great so words, to, great words to hear. Uh, Rabbi Chaim Bruck with the synagogue in Bozeman. So great to have you on the show this morning. Thanks for being with us. And uh, apologize. Have a happy Passover, Montana. We'll see you on the other side.